If you're into history, you probably know that the name Normandy comes from the word Northman. The region of Normandy in the north of France became home to a people called the Normans, a famous people from the early medieval period who have been remembered most famously for their conquest of England, becoming the kings of England in 1066, as well as for their adventures in the Mediterranean, capturing Sicily and a few other places there as well. Of course, the Normans are famous because they influenced the English language, adding many Norman French words to what had before been a largely Germanic language. Love English pudding. But in this video, I want to find out where the Normans came from. How did Normandy become this enclave that mixed both Viking roots with a new French culture? The first Viking activity in what is today Normandy occurred in around 820, when Viking raiders sailed down the Seine and attacked various sites along the coast and along the river. Now, of course, the main date for the start of the Viking Age that's often given in the West, at least, is 793, with the attack on the monastery of Lindisfarne off the coast of England. Now, in the 790s and the early 800s, we see many of these small-scale raids originating from Norway and then from Denmark that attacked largely monastic foundations and other rural areas. But a little bit later on, we start to see much bigger groups of Viking raiders, often several ships' worths or crews coming together to attack somewhat larger targets. And this is what we see occurring in the 830s and 840s, including culminating in attacks on Paris, a very important city in the Western Frankish Kingdom as it was then. Now to reach Paris, this incredibly wealthy target for these Viking raiders, they had to actually sail there because they didn't walk there over land. And so what they had to do is they had to find one of the tributaries or one of the rivers that leads into the Seine, which they could then sail down to reach Paris. And of course that is where modern day Normandy is today. So already early on in the Viking Age, Normandy was an important place for raiders attacking Frankish sites like Paris and along the river. One of the largest attacks on Paris was in 845 and involved hundreds or potentially thousands of different Scandinavians attacking the settlement. They were eventually beaten back by the Frankish Count Odo, but they would return and try again. For example, in 861, they would do just this, a surprise attack on Paris. But because of the oncoming winter, they didn't actually sail home, but instead stayed along the River Seine in various ports, as the Frankish annals tell us. And this is the first real sign that they do actually start to settle in the north of what is today France. There are several occasions, archaeologically speaking, where we found some kind of evidence for forts that are being built by these various raiding parties that are coming down the Seine, often on islands that are in the river because these are easily defendable points against Frankish attacks if they are attacked from land so that they only have to fight them on one front. And what's very interesting actually is that one of these has been dated to around 9 900 and by some archaeologists has been connected to a figure called Rollo who we'll be talking about a little bit more in this video. Because 11 years later in 911 AD the Frankish emperor in the west Charles the Simple strikes a deal with one of these heads of these Viking bands that are coming down the rivers in what becomes known as the Treaty of Saint-Clair sur Epte. And this will change the history of Normandy and France and England, and probably the world, in some way, forever. While the account of this treaty only survives from later sources, it probably did take place because of the political ramifications that we can see occurring afterwards. It basically mentions that a figure called Rollo becomes ruler in part of the north of France. So let's take a quick break from the historical aspect of the video and then take a look at this individual called Rollo. Now, first of all, Rollo uh, is the name of a suite these days, so you might have come across it in that way. But Rollo was the name of a Viking leader or a Scandinavian leader of some repute and some fame, but he's known by different names in different sources. So the Old Norse name that's most often given for him is Rolver, which itself is actually a contraction of a longer Old Norse name, which is something like Rudolver, which means fame wolf, that Olver being like wolf at the end. However, in Norman French at the time, he's sometimes referred to as Roux and sometimes as Rolun as well. Now, it's worth noting that he gets the baptismal name of Robert or Robert in French, 
but later Scandinavian sources call him something like Gungu Rolver or Ganga Rolf or Rolf the Ganga, which sometimes then has become Rolf the Walker in the English translation. And this nickname actually only comes much later, which is in Heimskringla, which is written in the 13th century by the Icelandic author Snorri Sturluson. And so we have to take it with a little bit of a pinch of salt because it's written much further away and much further in time forward good English syntax there but we do know a little bit about Rollo but a lot of it is shrouded by mystery which is captured by Robert Ferguson a historian who's written about him he says also known to his biographers chroniclers and poets as Rollo Roland Robert Rodolf Ruinus Rosso Rotli and Rolf Ganga Rolf or Rolf the Walker Founder in about 911 of what became the Duchy of Normandy is another of those like Ragnar Harry breaches, that's Lothbrok, uh, or Ivar the Boneless, that's Bain Lause, whose prominence among their contemporaries conspired over the years with an almost complete lack of biographical information to transform them from ordinary mortals into dense hybrids of men, myth, and legend. What Ferguson is basically saying here is that we don't know an awful lot about Rollo, because at the time people weren't writing much about him. It's only later when this duchy of Normandy as it would become became this powerful entity and that they themselves were writing things down that he is seen as a founding figure and so lots more is written about him. But we don't know how accurate this information is given that a lot of it's written you know, around 100 years after he became the ruler in Normandy. So we don't actually know where he came from. A lot of scholars do tend to think that he was from what is today Denmark, that he led the Danes. This would make sense because a lot of the raiding parties that attacked the northern Frankish coast were from Denmark and there were Danes uh, in England at the same time. There were frequent raids across the channel, so it would make sense that he himself was a Dane. However, in that same source from the 13th century in Iceland, Heimskringla actually gives him a Norwegian family. But in general, the Icelandic sources are more concerned with the Norwegians because that was their closest point of contact. Something that may give a clue as to his origin was recently proposed because it has been written down by a, a monk called Dudo of San Quentin, who actually wrote a, a biography, the Historia Normanum, as it's called, the history of the Normans, written down at the very end of the 10th century, mentioned that he was close allies with a, a figure called Astelm. And for a very long time, historians didn't know who this Asthelm was. There was no one written down with this name. But recently, or it's been proposed that this might have referred to Athelstan, which if you're into your Anglo-Saxon history, will know that this is an Anglo-Saxon name. But actually, it probably refers to a Dane who was ruling in East Anglia at a similar time to when Rollo was active in that channel region. And he was formerly known as Guthrum. But after having been defeated by Alfred the Great at the Battle of Eddington, he was baptized and so received a Christian name, which was Athelstan. And so that Astel may be the Norman way of writing down that Athelstan uh, and so be referring to Guthrum, who was also a Dane. So that is another connection to Denmark there. A little bit more about that in this video about Alfred the Great. Now we know that in 876, Rollo is already active in this region. He is probably the one that leads this big raid down the Seine in that year. He's also most likely involved, if not the main man, leading the attack on Paris in 885, when they once again sail down the Seine and attack that big city. Now, what's interesting is that this proposal in the Treaty of saint clair sur epte is basically that a part of Francia will be given away to be ruled by this Dane. Now, part of the reason is the kind of idea of if you can't beat them, join them. But what's interesting is that this idea had already been practiced by the Franks uh, for some time by 911 AD, but not in what's today France, but in areas of what is today the Netherlands and Germany in the region of Frisia, which I talked about in this video. So I guess like in so many other things, the French are just copying what the Dutch had done before. <laughs> Retrospectively, the idea that in 911 the Frankish or the West Frankish Emperor would give away part of his land to the Vikings seems a little bit ludicrous, but as I mentioned, they'd actually already been doing this in Frisia for quite some time. 
What's different about this, however, is that in Frisia, they had just been giving these Danish warlords territories in benefice, which meant that they acknowledged the Frankish uh, rulers as their overlords and they would act as a kind of vassal who would collect taxes that would then be given to the Frankish ruler. However, in Normandy, there is a great deal more independence that Rolf would be given over that territory. We can see a little bit of the thought process as it's written down by Dudo of Saint-Quentin, who was writing, I think, in the time of it will be Rollo's grandson or great-grandson, who was would become one of the first dukes of Normandy in the Historia Normanorum. And he says, if you will trust us, we will give you advice fitting and wholesome for you and for the kingdom, so that the people who are all too stricken with want may have repose. Let the land from the river Andel to the sea be given to the pagan peoples, and in addition, join your daughter to Rolo in marriage, and thereby you will be able to grow mightily in power against the peoples who resist you. For Rolo is born of the proud blood of kings and of chiefs. He is very fair of body, a ready fighter, far-sighted in counsel, seemly in appearance, amenable to us, a faithful friend to those in whom he gives his word, a ferocious enemy to those whom he opposes, a constant and amenable vassal in all things, with a shrewd mind such as we need. Now, obviously this is a description of Rolo, but considering it was written so much later, uh, we probably can't say if all of this applies to him and this is obviously steeped in Norman propaganda with seeing this founding father in such positive light. What is actually very interesting to note, however, is that originally they didn't offer Normandy as this point, but instead Flanders, but that Rollo rejected this on account of it being too soggy, being too damp, and instead he got what is now Normandy, which is quite interesting. So the Treaty of saint clair sur Ept is very important because it establishes this uh, kingdom that is now, well, it's not a kingdom, but a, a part of land that is now ruled over by Rollo and will be ruled over by his descendants. Now, it starts off being fairly small, consisting of four pagi. Now, pagi is the word used by the Franks for their counties, and these counties included Cau, Talou, Roumois, and Evreux. And the capital of this area would be around Rouen, which is where we believe Rollo set up his base of operations. There were also Danish settlers that followed Rollo into this region, but most of them lived in the north, close to the shore. Of course, they're a very maritime people, and like to be connected with the various Scandinavian diasporas that lived in uh, Britain and Ireland and also in Denmark. So they enjoyed being close to the, the sea to be able to uh, put to sea if they wanted to. So a lot of them lived in the, in the north of Normandy rather than in the south. However, it's not like it was a kind of huge takeover and the other people that lived there before were all driven out. In fact, there is a lot of evidence for intermarriage between them and the local people who were speaking some kind of old French at the time. And it's thought that the Old Norse language probably died out really quite quickly in Normandy, perhaps even within uh, a generation. If there had been a lot of inbreeding between the various peoples there, then it's likely that the language spread and caught on quite quickly. This area becomes known as Upper Normandy because it's the upper part, but it wouldn't be the entirety of Normandy for long because in the reigns of Rollo's son and grandson, it would actually grow much larger because in 924 and 933, their territory was extended to also include the neighboring area of Lower Normandy. In particular, an area of interest here is the Cotentin Peninsula, because this had actually been occupied by Scandinavian settlers before it was given to this duchy of Normandy. But these settlers, instead of coming from Denmark, which is what the archaeological evidence for most of the settlement in the eastern side of Normandy suggests, the, the settlements in the Cotentin Peninsula seem to have come from uh, Norse or Hiberno-Norse people coming from originally Norway that were active in the Irish Sea region. So in the Scottish Isles, the Western Isles, uh, as well as in the various seaports in Ireland and in the top of Wales in areas of northwestern England, they came down and they settled in Cotentin. And so you've got a bit of a mixture of various Scandinavian groups mixing in with the local French and potentially some Frankish population as well. Part of the deal was that Rollo had to accept 
baptism, which is when he gets the the Romanized or the or the Christian name of Robert or Robert. Another part of the deal was that he had to stop any Viking raiders coming and attacking down the Seine. That was essentially what Charles the Simple, the West Frankish emperor, got out of this, was that he had these crack troops that he had fought against in the past, now stationed at the river mouth of the Seine to basically block off any of these waterborne Viking raiders from attacking Paris and causing him huge headache once again. And it seems that Rollo did this really well because we get no more recorded raids on Paris following this time. Now Rollo is a very interesting figure and it seems that he probably becomes acculturized very quickly uh, just the same as his people and it's possibly because he becomes uh, somewhat sort of a mixture between his Scandinavian roots and his new sort of Norman or French identity that a lot of his followers do the same. He marries Gisela which is the daughter of the West Frankish Emperor and so uh, the, f the f next rulers of Normandy are themselves genetically a mixture of both Scandinavian and French descent and so will have been raised with feet in both worlds, so to speak. We also know that he doesn't set up a thing, which is the name for the legislative assembly, but instead follows the legislative practices of the Carolingian world, which is quite different to what was being done in Scandinavia. We also get the idea that the Old Norse language disappears quite quickly and that most people, especially the aristocracy, start speaking French rather fast albeit French with a now added Norse flavour which survives in some words in the Norman dialect. More about that and the acculturation process I talk about in this video about the Normans and their cultural identity. We do, however, get some traces that, you know, they, they did maintain a Scandinavian identity a little bit longer. And there are certain differences within regions of Normandy. I already mentioned the Cotentin Peninsula, which had been settled by a different group of Hiberno-Norse that had come down from the Irish Sea region. And there we do find a place name called Le Tanglant in French, which comes from the Old Norse Thing Land. So the, the land where the thing is held, the assembly of the free people is held. And so we do get clues as to the, the Norse heritage surviving. Many of the laws themselves also seem to be more Norse in character than Carolingian, like the right to banish is quite an important one. Another homage to the older Norse culture can be found in a 10th century surname that appears in Normandy, which is something like Uskei, which probably comes from the Old Norse word Huskarl. Now this is most often translated as Huskarl or Huskarl in modern English, and these were the elite or the crack troops, the retinue or bodyguard of elites. And so it's likely that this name sort of passed on because uh, Rollo and his descendants probably had an elite retinue, uh, a kind of bodyguard of these heavily mailed, often using big Dane axes at this point, like we see uh, surprisingly enough on the on the bio tapestry afterwards because Harold Godwinson's retainers are also these sort of house calls as you might call them but this does suggest that house calls were also something that were found in Normandy as well and finally we also have of course the very famous maritime techniques used by the the Norse, they are also being employed by the Normans. These ships, they do appear fairly similar in form, at least to the long ships that we find in the Viking Age used by the Scandinavians as we see them here on the Bayo Tapestry. This video was requested and made possible by House Thornhoff, who is one of my very loyal patron supporters, loyal and patient, I might add, Patreon supporters who is helping me to produce this kind of content and requested that I make a video about Rollo and the foundation of Normandy. So many thanks to his caning tier support and for helping the channel out with that. All right, everyone, thank you very much for watching this video about the origin of Normandy, how it came about as this kind of blended culture and settlement of maybe you'd call them Vikings or Scandinavians in the very north of Francia. I hope you have enjoyed the video. Let me know what you thought in the comments below. Would you like to see any more videos about the Viking Age in general? What kind of things would you like me to cover? 
A little uh, bit of personal information for you all here. I have uh, moved house and I am once again a student. I'm once again studying, uh, studying Viking and medieval studies now. So uh, I'm tempted to do a bit more Viking content because I'm working with it all the time. I'm constantly in the library and reading, finding out new things. So if that is something you're interested in, then do let me know in the comments because that would be great because then I know what you guys want me to do. Anyway, huge thank you for the uh, kind support and patience of House Thornhoff in helping out the channel and to all my other patrons for doing exactly the same. Thank you all very much for watching and until the next time, I have been Hilbert and this has been The History.